start something. Uh, I'm going to start this morning, but actually I'm going to finish it uh, next week, and you'll you'll kind of find out as we as we go along why. But I want you to I want you, I'm going to ask you a question like I always do, but I don't want you to answer out loud, okay? But I want you to think to yourself the answer to this question. All right, here's the question: What does success look like? <clears throat> think about that for a moment. Don't answer it out loud. What does success, now listen, what does success look like? Now I realize it's going to look different. It should look different to each and every person in here. But now I want you to think about that question, but I need you to do something. I need you to take yourself out. Pretend you're not in church, okay? Pretend you're not in church because some of you are sitting here in church and you're thinking, oh, well, Pastor Troy, success looks like me leading 770 people to the Lord this week, right? Right? Take yourself out of church, okay, and give, me, and give me your real answer. What is your real thought? When I, when I ask that question, what does success look like to you, what is your first thought? What are you thinking success looks like? Now, I'm going to give you some examples, and I got a couple slides to show you. <clears throat> but here's one thing. Here's one thing success looks like. You ready? Here's the first slide. Yeah. How many of you would agree with that? Come on. Come on. Does money equate to success? Come on, when you see somebody, when you know somebody who has a lot of money, what is your first thought? They are what? They're successful. They're successful, right? Come on, that's just the natural progression. That's what we think. Let, let me give you another slide. How about this one? Yeah, if you live in that house, come on, if you live in that house this morning, if you got up this morning in that mansion, in that house, you are probably what? Successful. And I don't understand why you haven't invited me over either, okay? But come on. Does that equal success? Absolutely. Absolutely. How about, how about this one? Oh, now we're talking, okay? At least you're talking my language. Kind of got stretched or something there, okay? Now you're talking. If you drove to church in that, at least when I see you drive up, I'm thinking, they're successful, they are successful. A new car. You're talking, that looks like success, doesn't it? I got one more for you. You might not understand this picture, but, but I'll explain it. How about this one? <laughs> Come on. Does that look like success? And, and, and I labeled this one position. Position, right? If you're, if you're a CEO, if you're a CFO, if you're the president of a company, if you own a company, if you're a manager, if you're a district manager, a regional manager, if you're the head of a department, I could go on and on and on and on. If you're a leader in a company, you're probably what? Successful. Successful, right? Now, now and, and the, for those of us that are married, how many of us that are married want to have a successful marriage, right? Okay, now follow my train of thought. None of those things are bad, okay, because that's not where I'm going. But none of them are bad. None of them at all. Are. Listen, if you woke up this morning, drove out of that house in your Ferrari with the bag of cash in the back seat, you're okay. It's okay. And, and you're serving God, and you're generous to his kingdom. It's okay. So please, I don't want anybody to leave here this morning thinking, oh, I got to sell my Ferrari, Okay, you, you got to let me borrow it, but you don't, it's, that's not what I'm trying to say this morning, okay? So I want you to understand that, and, and I do have one more slide. Here's one more slide. You ready? Super Bowl champions, okay? That is success, okay? I, I think that's more of a dream that keeps fading week after week after week, okay? But that would be success. You know, the Bible does say that nothing, nothing is impossible for God. But I'm going to have to talk to him about that one, okay? Because I don't know, okay? But that would be success. Man, if you're a Super Bowl champion, you're sitting there, you're like, we had a what? Successful year. Now, listen, all of these things are good. But now, here's what I want to talk about because, because I want you to get something out of what I want to share this morning because I don't think we see success the same way that God sees success. And again, none of those things are bad. But I don't think we see success the same way God sees success. So I want to I share with you a verse. 
And then we'll dive into this verse, and I'll kind of explain it as we go along. But if you got your Bibles, your phones, whatever you have, tablets, it'll also be back on the screen there. Here's our first scripture this morning. Psalm 92, verses 12 to 14. And I'm going to show you what God thinks success looks like. Here we go. Psalm 92, verses 12 to 14. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Now, I want to get to success in just a second, but I, but I got to back up in this first because I need you to see this. I need you to see who this verse is talk, who this promise is actually for. And it says it in the very first verse, the righteous, the righteous shall flourish. This promise is for the righteous. It's for the righteous. Now, now I, I need to get you to understand. Righteousness is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. You can't earn it. You can't produce it on your own. Righteousness is a gift from God. I know this is kind of an old illustration, but, but it, it, it works, so I'm going to stick with it. Most of us know, I know when you were kids, when you heard little kids, or if you've had little kids, you, you try to teach them that. How many of you know the moon does not have a light of its own, right? Most of you are old enough to know that now, okay? But when you were kids, you probably thought, the moon makes its own light. But how many of you know the moon is actually just reflecting the light of the sun, S-U-N, right? The moon just reflects the sun's light. It makes no light of its own. We, as believers, we're like the moon in that sense. We don't produce any righteousness of our own, but we reflect the righteousness of the sun, S-O-N, okay? But now here's what happens. How many of you have ever seen, you've seen a half moon, seen that little sliver, that crescent moon? Do you know why you get a half moon and a crescent moon and a smaller and, and you know why? Because the earth gets in the way of the reflection of the sun, you know why some Christians don't reflect righteousness very well? Because the earth gets in the way of the reflection of the sun, S-O-N. A lot of Christians out there walking around like a little crescent moon. Huh? They're just like, because, because we've allowed the things of this earth to block out the reflection of God's righteousness. We don't produce righteousness on our own, but we're called to reflect his righteousness. But when we allow the world to get in there and block it all off, we don't reflect his righteousness. So this promise that we're looking at, I need you to understand that it's, it is for the righteous. It's, it, it's for the righteous. And let me, let me give you a scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our righteousness is in who? It's in Christ. It's in Christ. So this promise, this, this, this scripture that we're looking at is for the righteous. That's you and I. Now, the other word I want you to see in this verse is flourish. Did you see that in there? The word flourish. It's actually mentioned three times. Verse 12, it says that, that the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Verse 13 says those who are planted in the church, in God's house. Do you ever think about that? Those who are planted right here this morning. Those who are planted in God's house shall flourish. And verse 14, it says, when you get old and, and you're getting older, you'll be fresh and flourishing. Here's what I want you to see in this. One of the definitions for the word flourish, guess what it is? Succeed. Succeed. One of the definitions, and there was quite a few of them, but one of the definitions for flourish was to succeed or to be successful. So let me read those verses. It says, you will be successful like a palm tree. If you're planted in the church, you will succeed. It says when you're older, you will be fresh and successful. That's what this scripture is telling us. God wants us to flourish. Would you agree with me this morning? God wants us to flourish. God wants us all to be successful. Listen, I think, I think all of us this morning could agree that God wants us to be successful, right? God doesn't want you to fail. God is for you. He's not against you. God wants us to be successful. But here's the problem is, here's, here's what the problem is. The problem is most of us have a different idea of what success is than what God is, God has. 
We have a different view of success than what God has. And listen, for many people this morning, and I want to encourage you in this one, really. This is kind of a, a sidetrack, but a lot of us, even us here this morning, we allow other people in our lives, friends, family, coworkers, we allow other people in our lives to define what success is for us. Don't do that. Don't do that. God is the one who defines what success is. And I'm going to show you that right now. So what does God say success looks like? It was actually in those verses that I read to you, and it was none of those things on the list that I showed you. Um, are you ready? Here's what God says success looks like. Give me a picture back there. Success, according to God, looks like a tree. Success, according to God, looks like a palm tree. That, none of you are like, yes, you guys got more excited for the Ferrari and the house and the bag of money and all of that, right? Come on. That's what God says success looks like. To be successful, to flourish, looks like a palm tree. It looks like a palm tree. That wasn't on any of your list. Listen, that's what God thinks success looks like. Now, now, to make sense out of that, because honestly, none of us look like palm trees. That's, an, that's a compliment to all of you, okay? We don't look like, the, you're thinking, well, Troy, how can I walk around looking like a palm tree so I look successful? To understand what we're talking about here, we need to take a look at the palm tree. We need to kind of get an understanding of the palm tree. So, so I want to tell you this before we jump into all of this. The scriptures this morning are New King James and NIV. The palm tree stuff is Google, is Google, okay? It's Google. It's not me. I am not a horticologist. Did I say that right? Horticulturist, okay? You want to know how I spelt it on my notes? Hordo, okay? Because <laughs> not only am I not one, I couldn't spell one even if I was one, okay? Listen, I, it's the study of vegetation and plants and stuff. I'm not one of those, okay? I'm not one of those. But, 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 but Google is, and I've heard pastors tell, tell people their congregation this. Listen, if you ever have a question for me, Google it first. If Google doesn't give you the answer, come see me, okay? All the information I'm going to give you about palm trees came from Google this morning. So if you have an argument with it, Google it, okay? <laughs> Google it, all right? So I want to show you this morning the, the palm tree. Because man, the more I dug into this, that's why it's going to take two weeks. It's a very unique tree, it's, it's, it's got so many characteristics about the palm tree that I never even knew. So I want to look at some of those characteristics of a palm tree to see, we're going to look at the characteristics to see what God sees in a palm tree that equates to success. Are you following me? If we see the characteristics of a palm tree, then maybe we'll begin to understand why God said success looks like a palm tree. So I'm going to give you a few this morning and a few more next week. Man, as I started down this, I could probably go for three or four weeks, okay? I'm just going to give you a few this morning. If you're taking notes, here's the first one, characteristic of, of a palm tree. Here we go. Number one, the palm tree is one of few trees that does not really burn. Okay, I had her underline really because some of you are like, oh, no, 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 no. I've seen a palm tree burn, okay? A palm tree does not, if, usually if you've seen a palm tree burning, you usually see that top part burning, okay? Very few times, not very often, will you see a whole palm tree engulfed in flames. It doesn't happen. And if it does, it's usually because the palm tree is dried out, it's sick, or the temperature just got too hot, 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 okay? Palm trees, for the most part, do not burn. They do. Listen, we don't cut palm trees down, the, the, the stock of a palm tree. You don't cut a palm tree down and put it aside and use it for firewood. You don't do that because, number one, even if you could get it to start on fire, if you brought palm, palm tree wood to, a, to the beach picnic, number one, you probably wouldn't get the fire started. Number two, if you put it on a fire that was already started, all you'd get is a bunch of smoke. Everybody would be mad at you at the beach. You'd, you'd cover that beach in smoke because palm trees, the wood of a palm tree, it just doesn't burn. It just doesn't burn for the most part. They just don't burn. So success, follow me on this, is like a palm tree. What's the point? Success, success is knowing I'm living a life in Christ that will not burn me. Success is living a life in Christ 
that I will not get burned up. That's what success looks like to God. Now, here, here's how I'm going to illustrate that. Because, because even in church, how many of you notice this? Even in church, we don't like to talk about hell. Right? Even in church, we don't like to talk about hell. How many of you have ever been to a funeral where somebody went to hell? Never. <laughs> yeah, you've been there, but they didn't say it probably, huh? Here lies Fred. He's in hell, right? I mean, you just, we, we don't talk about it that way, right? Everybody's going to heaven, right? Everybody's going to heaven. And even in the church, we don't like to talk about it. We don't even like to think for a moment somebody could possibly go to hell. And, and, and even when we do, even when we do, even in the church, we usually think, well, you know what? It's for really, 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 really bad people. Only really, 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 really bad people go to hell. And it's probably not that bad. It's probably not that bad. Not. Not, okay? Not. The Bible talks a lot about hell. And I'm not going to give you too many verses. I'm not even going to give you verses on this first point, but there was quite a few of them. But several times in the Bible, it uses phrases like a lake of fire a lake of fire how many of you like going to the lake how many like water skiing how many like diving how many of you like water skiing on a lake of fire does it sound like fun does it sound like a place you'd want to hang out for the weekend no and this is my point but but when we talk about hell people just have i don't know what they picture it's a lake of fire the bible talks about how it says burning and gnashing of teeth it's not a joke. It's not a joke. I remember growing up, uh, you know, I wasn't saved all my life. I got saved at the end of high school, first year, something right in there. And I remember people talking, and we'd, we'd always say this stupid thing. It's like, I'd rather rule and reign in hell. How, come on, how many of you heard, heard that or said that? I'd rather rule and reign in hell than be a servant in heaven. Are you crazy? But that's the mindset. Listen to me this morning. Hell is not a joke. It's not a joke. It's nothing to, be, nothing to be joked about. And listen, when, we, when we, we hear people talk about this, and we say it a lot of times, many times you'll hear people um, refer to accepting Jesus, saying the sinner's prayer. You'll hear people refer to that as getting what? Fire what? Fire insurance. Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You ever heard somebody say, oh, you accepted the Lord, or you said the sinner's prayer? That's just what? Fire insurance. That's just fire insurance. Now, we here this morning know it takes a lot more than just repeating a prayer and all of that. But why do they call it fire insurance? Because by accepting Jesus into your life, you're what? You're avoiding hell. You're avoiding getting burned up. You're avoiding hell. Listen, as a Christian, as a Christian this morning, success starts by avoiding hell. Success starts by avoiding hell. Now listen to me. If you, if you spend all your life on earth, if you don't make millions and millions of dollars, if you don't live in that house, if you never drive a Ferrari, if you never become the CEO or, or, or any of those things, listen, listen to me. But you avoid hell? But you avoid hell? Listen to me. You are more successful than, than Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. Um, I don't know their spiritual condition, but I think how many of you, you understand what I'm talking about, right? If you avoid hell, you're, you're more successful than the richest person on this earth. You are more successful than the richest person on this earth. Listen, there are going to be, quote unquote, a lot of successful people in hell. In hell. Success to God looks like a palm tree. You will not get burned up. You won't get burned. You will avoid hell. Now here's the second one, and it, and it kind of goes along with the first one. Because how many of you want to avoid hell? <laughs> yeah, you better all have said yes, okay? I mean, avoiding hell is terrific. It's awesome. It's, it's huge. But here's the second one. Number two, if you're taking notes, a palm tree is evergreen. It's evergreen. It's evergreen. It's always alive. That speaks to me about salvation. So listen to me. Not only do we avoid hell, but guess what? We get heaven. 
We get heaven. I mean, it's great just to avoid hell, but it gets even better than that. We get heaven on top of it. We get heaven on top of it. Listen, salvation, when it talks about salvation, that's, that's evergreen. Salvation is eternal. It lasts forever and ever and ever. Now, and, and please listen to me. I'm going to give you a verse in just a moment. I'm not talk, when I say salvation is evergreen, that it lasts forever, I'm not talking about once saved, always saved. So please don't misunderstand me. Let me, let me give you this scripture real quick. Um, Hebrews 5. I, I wrote it wrong here. So no, I didn't. 5, 9. It says this. And having been perfected, Jesus, he became the author of eternal what? Eternal salvation to all. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Not to all. Not to all. He did not become the author of eternal salvation to all. He didn't. He became the author of eternal salvation to all what? Who obey him. Who obey him. Listen, it's important to say that prayer. It's important to repeat after me and do all of that. But listen, salvation, eternal salvation comes to those who obey him. Who obey him. You see, that's, that, that's, what, it's, that's what eternity is about. That's what eternity is about. And, and I want you to get this because, again, I think this is something the church, something this world misses so much. We have, listen to me, we have before birth, we have this life on earth, and then we have eternity. Before birth. Before birth, you know, that's, that's about nine months. It's about nine months while you're in your mother's womb. Some check out early, some check out a little bit longer, okay? But it's about nine months. And when you're in your mother's womb, listen to me. You have no idea of what's out there. You have no idea of what lies ahead. In fact, you don't even know what your mother looks like when you're in her womb. You really don't. You, now, you might hear her voice. I don't really remember, okay? But listen, you have no idea. You have no idea what it looks like outside of there. So, so, so that's, that's before birth. Then we have this life on earth. Um, I Googled it, okay, because Google's always right. Um, average lifespan, 70 to 80 years. Again, some check out sooner, some check out later. We have a life on earth, 70 to 80 years. Listen to me. Just like being in the womb of your mother, when this life on earth is over, you have no idea what's ahead of you. Now, as believers this morning, we've got a little bit of a picture. But even the Bible says for us, no eye has seen, no, no, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, no mind can even imagine what God has prepared. So even, even though we're living on this earth 80, 90 years, even longer, you don't even know what's ahead of you. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be incredible. And then third, we have eternity. We have eternity. Again, I don't think we grasp that. So take this. So, so take that 80 years on earth plus the nine months in the womb. Multiply that by a zillion, okay? And then take that number and multiply it by another zillion, all right? And then take that number and multiply it by another zillion, okay? You following me? You still haven't completed one day of eternity at that point. That's how huge this is. That's how important this is. This, this, this life we're living on earth is setting up eternity. It's setting up eternity. We think this is so, we think this is all there is. And listen to me, this is very, very important because it sets up eternity. But eternity lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. Listen, we all have heard about successful people who've had the money, who've had the cars, who have had the fame, the fortune, the position. And lost it all. Success to God looks like a palm tree. It's everlasting. It's everlasting. It's eternal. It's eternal. Here's the third one. A palm tree surrounded by other palm trees creates an oasis. A palm tree surrounded by other palm trees creates an oasis. How many of you know that a palm tree on its own does not produce much shade? I think it's uh, one of John's favorite places. I think it's San Clemente. When you go to the beach down at San Clemente, down by the pier, and I love that spot down there, 
You go to the beach down there, they have palm trees along that beach. And it's funny because you'll see people in the summertime, they're kind of laying, they're trying to get some shade, you know, and a palm tree has got the skinny base and then it goes on the top. Well, when it casts a shadow, it's just this little shadow is like, and then this, you'll see people kind of laying under that shaded spot, but you don't see them all lined up, you know, in the trunk spot where it's just one little line because a palm tree doesn't make much shade, not much at all. But listen. You take a whole bunch of palm trees and put them together, they actually create an oasis. They actually, I, I, I've got a picture here for you. And that's actually a real picture. It doesn't look very real up there. How many of you, just out of curiosity, um, how many of you ever really, really seen, not like pictures and stuff, has anybody ever really seen an oasis? Been to one, anything? I never have either, okay. But, but in my studying, Man, I came across some, inc- I, I could spend the rest of the morning just next, next, just showing you incredible pictures. Don't go next. But the, there are some amazing, an oasis is an incredible, I, I'm going to call it God, but they're, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. A lot of times they're in the desert places. There's, there's many in Israel and it's like there's sand, there's desert and boom, there's that. And what happens in an oasis is usually that you see a bunch of palm trees together. One palm tree does not create an oasis, but many palm trees together will, will, will create an oasis. I got, I got one more picture for you. This is actually a picture of a place called Engedi, and that's only the waterfall part, but it's, it's, it's an oasis. And if that name sounds familiar, there's a story in the Bible where, where, king, where David, he wasn't king yet, had an encounter with King Saul, and it was in one of the caves of Engedi. It was actually an oasis. It was actually an oasis. They're, 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 they're incredible. They're, beauty, but they're beautiful. But I know most of you have probably seen them in a movie. You've probably seen a picture of them. If not, that's kind of what they look like. But now here's what I want you to think about. Imagine you're walking along in the desert, the sand, the dry desert, for days and days and days. And then you see this oasis. What are you thinking? You're thinking, oh, you're, you're thinking refreshing, right? Oh, man, it's going to be refreshing. It's going to be refreshing. Let me give you a scripture, and then I'll talk a little bit about Oasis. Uh, the scripture is, can't see it on my notes, uh, Matthew 8.20. I wrote my notes in a hurry. 18.20, thank you. For where two or three, this is talking about Christians, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there, what, in the midst of them. For where two or three are gathered in my name, just follow me, give me a little liberty this morning, it creates an oasis. For where two or three are gathered in my name, it creates an oasis. Listen to me this morning. The church, this right here, this is an oasis. When we get together, we should be forming an oasis. A place where people can come to to get refreshed. A place where people can come to to get hope. A place where people can come to to get encouragement. A place to come to when you're in a dry place, when you're in a dry season. You can come into the church where a bunch of other palm trees have gathered to create an oasis. And you can come in here and be refreshed and strengthened and encouraged. This right here should be an oasis. Think about success for a moment and some of the things we were talking about a while ago. Success when you're all by yourself. It can be trouble. It's usually fleeting. But, but when we think of people that have become successful and they become hermits or they've been shut-ins, or the, it's usually, they usually live a miserable life. But listen, when we come together like this, oh, you, can't be a, uh, you can't be an oasis by yourself. But when we come together like this in God's house, we become an oasis. Um, I, I was thinking about this, so, so kind of picture this if you can. One snowflake, one snowflake, even if it's cold outside, one snowflake in your hand is probably going to do what? It's just going to melt. It's just going to melt. But now begin to link, link together snowflake after snowflake after snowflake after snowflake. What happens? Schools are shut down. Airports are shut down. Roads are shut down. If you live in the mountains in a house, you're shut in. Because all of these snowflakes have linked together and now they've become a force to be reckoned with. 
Listen, that, uh, what God is saying about the palm tree and all of this, he's saying, man, if we as Christians, if we as believers, if we as the church would join together, would join together, would come together, it's a recipe for success. It's a recipe for success. One of the most successful things you can have in your life this morning is number one, a physical family, and number two, a spiritual family. Those two things. Listen, could you imagine, just think about it for a moment, and I was thinking about it as Lori was leading prayer this morning. Could you imagine if the church in this nation, just this nation, if the church in our nation came together as one, as one in Christ. I mean, we have so many churches across this nation and they're doing their own thing. What if the church in this nation came together as one in Christ? What if the church in our nation began to pray in unity? Not just ignite your every church across. The, do you think it would make a difference in our nation? Come on. What if, what if every church across our nation... Every Christian in a church this morning began to vote for godly principles. And listen, I'm not, I'm not getting political on you. I'm not telling you what if every Christian voted Republican. No, 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 listen, what if every Christian, every church began to vote for godly principles? I don't care the party. You started to vote for godly principles, for what, for what God's word says for this nation. Do you think just that, come on, how many of you know that would change this nation alone? I mean, the church has such a power in itself and we're not even utilizing it because we're not coming together to create an oasis. We're all kind of out there on our own. Listen, listen, the Bible says, let me give you a couple verses. Um, Psalm 92, 13, the one we already read, it says, those who are what? Planted in the house of the Lord shall succeed. Man, if you will plant yourself in church, God's word says that you will succeed. If you don't want to plant yourself in church, listen, you're fighting the odds. You're fighting the odds. Let me give you, let me give you another verse, Hebrews 10, 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Listen, Hebrews is telling us, don't forsake getting together as believers. Don't forsake. Listen, that's how important this is. That's how important this is. A palm tree left on its own is just that. But a palm tree, when it gathers with other palm trees, creates an oasis. Listen, listen. Follow my train of thought. I'm going to go to the fourth one. But listen, if you've avoided hell and you have eternal life and you're in this oasis of people who can refresh you, encourage you, and lovingly correct you, Oh, man, you're, you're, you're doing good. You're successful. But here's number four. Palm trees cannot be grafted. Did you know that? I didn't know that. How many of you know what grafting means? Grafting is like, um, they do it a lot with apples. We, we used to go to a place called Oak Glen. Not Oakland, but Oak Glen. And there's like apple orchards everywhere. And we met this one elderly gentleman. And man, he just took a whole day one time with our kids and everything. It was like a whole day in school, was teaching of us about apple trees. And he had some trees that he had grafted. And what, what he does, I'm not sure the science of it all, but you could take a branch from another tree kind of and graft it into another tree. He had this one tree that produced, I don't know, three or four different kinds of apples on one tree. I, and I don't remember the apples, but he might have Granny Smith's on this branch, Red Delicious on this branch. Help me out. Um, yeah, those and some other ones on this branch, okay? He had like four different types of apples growing on one tree because they were all, they were grafted in. Now, now you think, I know where you think I'm going because the Bible tells us that we are grafted as Gentiles, we're grafted in. Well, I'm not going that way this morning, okay? I'm actually going the opposite way, okay? Because a palm tree, they, a palm tree, Google says, they say if you try to graft a palm tree, Google says it will die that you can't graft a palm tree. So follow my train of thought here. As a Christian this morning, when you graft the world into yourself, when you begin to allow worldly things into you, you're killing yourself. You're killing your opportunity to be successful. You're killing your witness. 
You'll kill your success. You'll kill your tomorrows. You'll kill your dreams. God does not want us grafting in the things of this world. Listen to me, please, please, please. Sin will always, always, always rob you. Sin will always rob you physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, any way you can think of. You cannot be successful and compromise. You cannot be successful and allow sin in. Okay, I'm not talking about, oh, you blew it and then you repented. Okay, that's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about allowing sin into your life, compromising the things of God. Listen, if we compromise, if we welcome sin into our lives, you can just kiss success goodbye. You can kiss success goodbye. Now, and I know some of you are thinking, some of you are sitting there right now. I can read your minds, okay? Some of you are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor Troy. I know a lot of sinners, Pastor Troy. I know a lot of sinners who are prospering, who are nourishing, who are successful, flourishing. Did I say nourishing? Who are successful, Pastor Troy. Uh, Again, what's the definition of success? What's the definition of success? Have they avoided hell? Do they have eternal life? Are they part of an oasis? No, I doubt it. Okay, so listen, listen. God wants you to be successful, but you cannot allow the things of this world to be grafted into you. And here's the, the, the fifth one and last one for this morning. And then I will actually have some more for you one more week. I had about 10 of these, believe it or not. Okay? I never Googled so much stuff in all of my life. Okay? Here's the fifth and last one this morning. But this one is huge. This one is really huge. Palm, palm trees thrive in tropical areas. Palm trees thrive. Say that real fast. Palm trees thrive in tropical areas. Why? Here's why. Follow me on this. Because their roots go really, really deep. Because their roots go real deep. Follow me. If you're rooted in the soil, if you're rooted in the soil, you won't be affected by the season. If you're rooted in the soil, you won't be controlled by the seasons of your life. Listen, I don't know if you're getting that, and I'll I'll kind of break it down and explain it. This is huge, though. The success that God is talking about doesn't come from what's around you. The success God is talking about doesn't come from what's around you. It comes from roots that are going deep into the things of God, deep into the the presence of God. It's not about what, what you have around you. Success is sinking those roots so deep so deep that the seasons of life won't affect you. As long as your joy, as long as your joy is affected by your circumstances, listen to me, you're not a palm tree. You're not living like a palm tree. The benefit of being a palm tree is your inner life, your inner life is affected by the soil, not the circumstances around you, not the seasons, not your season. Come on, we've all been, come on, we've all been through some tough seasons. The way to make it through those tough seasons is is sinking your roots down deep so that no matter what the season brings, your roots are sunk down deep into the things of God and you will succeed. Listen, this morning, if you're here this morning and you're going through a difficult season, man, you could be here this morning going through a good season. Understand this. Your inner joy is dependent on God's word, on God's promises, on the things of God, on his presence, on God's Holy Spirit who is in you and said he'd never forsake you. Dig your roots deep in prayer. Dig your roots deep in the word of God. Dig your roots deep in worship. Live by your soil, not by your season. Amen? Are you getting that one? Because listen, I think we all go through tough times. And we'll talk about this in the next coming weeks because most of you know this one. You ever seen a palm tree in the wind? Man, those suckers just, but they never fall over. It's because of their root system, but we're going to talk about that actually next week. But listen, when you dig your roots deep into the things of God, no matter what the season brings, it won't affect you because of the soil that you're planted in. Um, I got this from one of those cheesy plaques, okay, that I like. But it said this, happiness comes from happenings. Joy comes from God. 
Happiness comes from happenings. Joy comes from God. Nehemiah 8.10 says, do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Listen to me. Live by your soil and not by your season. So I'm wrapping it up right here. I'm going to finish early this morning. If you're thinking, oh, he's finishing early for the Charger game. Chargers don't play till like 5 o'clock tonight, okay? So I could have gone on and on and on this morning, okay? I'm giving you a break, okay? Here's what I, here's what I want to close with. The question this morning is, are you successful according to God's definition of success? You see, we started out this morning with what is success. But the real question this morning is, are you successful according to God's definition of success? Are you successful this morning like a palm tree? Number one, have you taken the steps to avoid hell? Have you taken steps to avoid hell? Have you asked Jesus into your life? Have you asked Jesus into your life? Number two, do you have eternal life? Eternal life doesn't come just by asking him into your life and repeating this prayer after me. We saw in that scripture. Eternal life comes from believing and obeying. And number three, are you joining together with other believers to create an, a, a, an oasis for those around you? Listen, this is how important that is. You're not just creating that oasis for you, but for all of those around you, for your family members, for your friends. Number four, are you allowing the things of this world to be grafted into your life? And the last one, like a palm tree, are you sending roots down deep into God's soil so that no matter what the season looks like, you will succeed? Listen, all of these this morning, I'm closing. If you're here this morning, and maybe you've never taken the steps to avoid hell. God says, man, you want to be successful. The first step is avoiding hell. If you're here this morning, and maybe you've said the sinner's prayer at one point in time, but you're just not serving, and maybe you backslid, maybe you just, you've just messed up, and you need to get back on track. You, you want to experience eternal life. Maybe you're here this morning, and you've forsaken the gathering of believers together, and you're realizing, man, I need to be an oasis to those around me. Maybe you're here this morning, and you've allowed the things of this world to choke out God in your life. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've just gone through the toughest season. And listen, I'm not making light of anything somebody might be going through. But listen to me this morning. No matter what you go through, if your roots are sunk down deep into the soil of God, you will make it through any season. I'll Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the message. You can check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or online at IgniteChurchOC.com.